أما بعد فأعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين إهدنا الصراط المستقيم صراط الذين أنعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين آمين So today will be the second part about talking about the in-laws. And uh, like I had mentioned, when it comes to the rights of the in-laws or the engagement of the families with the in-laws, for the most part what you find is the Sharia has been quiet. And uh, we talked about the consequences of that within the Sharia in detail. But today I want to talk about it from a different perspective, and that is from the civilizational perspective. Not from just the fiqhi perspective, but from the perspective of what Islam wants in a civilization. Within this discussion I will talk about some fiqhi aspects too. But those, you know, the, the issue with fiqh and the problem with fiqh is that Fiqh teaches you or explains to you what is the minimum requirement. And I have mentioned this before that a civilization cannot run based upon minimum requirements. For example, zakat and sadaqah. Everyone is required to give zakat. No one is required to give sadaqah. Except when? No one is required to give sadaqah except when you are being faced by the person asking you for the money that is in need, is really in the need and he's asking you, you've already given your zakat but he's somebody who's in front of you, you have five bucks in your pocket and he says, I really, really, really need this money and if you don't give it, you've given your zakat. You've already what? Given your zakat, but the situation before you is such that you are now in a situation where it is becoming mandatory upon you, wajib upon you to help your brother. Because helping the brothers is amongst the wajibats in Islam, is amongst the, uh, the obligations in Islam that we owe to one another. But in a society, in general, if you are giving zakat, but the requirements of the society may be something more than the money of zakat. For example, zakat may help 80% of the problem within the society. Or zakat may be helping 50% of the society. Where will the rest of the other 50% of the welfare money come from? Because what we have to, I know a lot of times we say this, if we apply the idea of zakat, all the problems of society will go away. But zakat is not the only form of economic distribution Islam has, or the only form of welfare Islam has. Oblig, obligatory, where you give the money to the government, and then the government allocates the resources as it wishes, is zakat. But then how you allocate more than that is sadaqah. How you allocate the monies beyond what the government will be taking, beyond what Baytul Mal will be taking, how you allocate the money of zakat is, up, is, up, is voluntary up to you. Now you want to help this charity or this charity or this poor person and so on and so forth, this is up to you. So, what I was saying is, is that society may need something more than what? Zakat. In order to fulfill its rights and obligations to its own citizens. It needs sadaqah. And sadaqah at that level, if it is the need of the country. By the way, I forgot to do the dua. Rabbi shahli sadri wa yasirli amri wa amri wa amri wa amri wa amri If it is the need of society, then that sadaqah itself is wajib. For the welfare of the people, even though the government has already taken zakat. In the same way, when there is ma'siya in society, what do I mean by ma'siya? By disobedience of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala within the society, is the way to deal with ma'siya 
that you tell the people the minimum? Or is the way to deal with ma'asiyah, you add things on so that they can hold on to the faraid? In other words, if somebody is having issues, psychological issues, let's say somebody uh, is into drugs or he's into alcohol, somebody who's into alcohol and drugs, is the way to cure him to tell him to only pray five times a day? Or is the way to cure him to tell him to pray five times a day plus ask Allah for help in the Hajjul? You know, with the dua that we say, إِيَّاكَ نَعْبُلُوا وَإِيَّاكَ نَسْتَعِينَ Oh Allah, to only you we worship, and from you we have, we seek istiana, istiana, help. Help in religious issues, help in spiritual issues, this is called istiana. And the, this same verse in Surah Al-Baqarah, وَاسْتَعِينُوا بِالصَّبْرِ وَالصَّلَىٰ وَإِنَّهَا لَكَبِيرَةٌ إِلَّا عَلَى الْخَاشِينَ Over here it's asking the Jews who know Prophet Muhammad is the Messenger of Allah, Allah is also asking them to get help. Istarinu bi sabri wa sala. The point I'm trying to make: what in dhikratan faul mu'minin? You know, sabr hisma rabbi kalayla. Because the way to purify yourself is the way to purify yourself is not to do the obligatory. The way to pure your purify yourself and to get rid of the bigger, the big, the baggage that we have. For example, the baggage that we have that inflicts us that. Uh, restrains us and strangles us, right? Internally, we're in strangled. Meaning, the more dhikr you'll do, the more release you'll feel, and the more you will be able to escape the baggage that holds you. So, what you find is the more the baggage is, the more you need to pray. So, the more the, 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 the burden on you, in terms of your psychological or physical or emotional issues, the more you need to turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But it's not fault. This is exactly like the example of zakat that I just gave. Zakat, if the society is healthy, if the society is healthy, then zakat may be enough. But if there are more problems than normally there should be, than what Islam anticipates. If there's a lot more problems, then zakat will not be enough. You will have to add what? Sadaqah to that. To that issue. You will have to add sadaqah to that. And that sadaqah at that time within that society will become like an obligation. Because it's the need of the society. If, if for example, the army went on jihad, you've already, everyone's given zakat. But everyone, if, if there's now jihad, meaning I mean like the Islamic state is in a state of war, so now people are going to stop giving? No, now they have to give more. So the issue I'm trying to say, the more burden there is, the farther away you have to go from the fara'id to release yourself. It's almost like, you know, you have the earth and you have the gravitational pull of the earth. And once you release yourself from the gravitational pull of the earth, then you reach a certain point where even a little bit of energy can help you what? Continue to move. You can continue to move. But you have to have that initial strong power to help you escape the force of the earth. And this is why all of the companions of the Prophet ﷺ, they all prayed which prayer in the beginning? Uh, but, uh, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says this in the last ayah of Sutul Muzammil. Who remembers the last ayah of Sutul Muzammil? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Inna rabbaka ya'lamu anna kataqumu adna min thuluth al-layli wa nisfahu wa thuluth wa ta'ifatu min al-ladhina ma'ak. Allah knows that a group of your companions they also stand up at night at the Hajjul time with you. Because these were the initial Sahaba and they needed an extra amount of energy to pull themselves up from the forces of gravity, you can say. So, when we're talking at a civilizational level, then we have to talk about not the minimum, but then we have to talk about what? The more, more than in order to get ourselves, it's almost like we need, we need such a force to pull us out of all of our, if, if we have problems, we have all have baggage and issues, we need a force that will pull us out of that uh, state that we're in. 
So when you, for example, and this is well known amongst uh, the uh, amongst the, the mystics of Islam, the Sufis of Islam, whatever you would like to call people of the Sabuf, that when you initiate someone, or in the beginning, there is a lot of emphasis on types of adhkar, <coughs> whether it is the Qadri Silsla or whatever Silslas there are, who you can see that there's a lot of emphasis on adhkar, but as you go higher in the ranks, and you're, you're able to bring yourself out to a certain lifestyle, right? Then the emphasis on the level of adhka in many of this, since there's not all of them, uh, they decrease. Because you've, uh, you've achieved through the adhka what you're supposed to achieve. So why am I saying all of this? I'm saying all of this so that we understand that there's a difference between what fiqah requires and what we require from the perspective of you can say fiqh sunnah understanding of the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu and the understanding of what a civilization needs. Now, let's come to the issue of the in-laws. Now, I talked about some rules last time, and over here I want to again start by uh, talking about the daughter-in-law and mother-in-law's relationship, and then after that I will talk about the son's relationship with his parents. So I ran into an interesting uh, point as I was reading uh, some of the very uh, authentic and some of the past books like Rad al-Mustaq and so on and so forth. So there are two opinions if there is a clash between the mother-in-law and the daughter-in-law, what to do? What is this, this, was the fiqah say? There are two opinions on this issue. One is that if there is a clash between the mother-in-law and the daughter-in-law, then if the wife says to the husband, I want a separate house because I can no longer live here, I don't feel secure here, and I don't feel comfortable here, then it is the right of the wife that the husband leave the parents and give her a separate house because she's not able to get along with the in-laws. This is one point. The second opinion, and by the way, this opinion that I gave is mostly from uh, the Hanafi scholars. Is mostly from what? Hanafi scholars. The second opinion is that, and this is mostly from uh, other scholars, some of the muhaddisi and so on and so forth, which is that if there is a clash between the husband and the wife, and the father says, and the father decides, that he should let go of his wife, that this is the right of the father to tell the son to do, and that uh, he would have to let go, meaning if he went to the judge and said, I am the father, and this is the hadith of the Prophet wasallam, and he goes to the qadi and says, this is my right, I don't want my, uh, my son with this girl because he's not good for her, and so on and so forth, and if he proves his case, meaning you have to prove your case, because even in the case of Umar bin Khattab, when he wanted him to divorce his, uh, when he wanted his son to divorce his daughter, so who did Umar go to? He went to the Prophet. Meaning it wasn't just simply that he said, okay, I'm the father, I want this. That's there too. But it, when it, the Prophet didn't have to listen to the case anymore, he didn't from the nasus we have, from the text we have, he didn't listen to the case anymore because he knew who was asking. But the Prophet ﷺ, when he's asked a shari matter to make a decision one way or the other, he's like a qadi, and for the qadi it is necessary that he understands the understanding of how to play the role of the qadi, that he has to listen to both the sides. So it is possible that the father-in-law goes to the qadi and the daughter-in-law responds and the qadi still says, no, 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 the marriage should be maintained. But the father has the right to ask the son to divorce his Daughter, Allah Now, having said that, so there are these two opinions, and one thing that we have, uh, one thing that I was uh, even talking to Brother Khalid about a little bit, but one thing that I started to observe as I'm thinking about this subject, uh, and uh, and I didn't realize how uh, fascinating this subject was for people because uh, as I started talking to other people about this, this was really a subject that really, I think, vibes true for a lot of people at many, many levels. Their sisters who are upset, their brothers who are upset, and so, uh, you know, 
husbands that are upset and uh, wives that are upset uh, is what I was meaning. So uh, the other thing then keeping in mind, besides, now I'm going to talk about the Shari aspect and then I'm going to talk above the Shari aspects of this. And that is what does Islam want? Uh, meaning what does Islam want? Not just fiqh, but what does the deen want as a whole? So the second thing to keep in mind is that when we are in a situation, for example, obviously there are the re so now let me go come to the son. So there is a difference of opinion regarding the mother-in-law and daughter-in-law. If the daughter-in-law says, I want a separate house, the husband has to provide her a separate house if she doesn't feel secure. Okay, and there have been even issues, uh, even scholars that I know, very well scholars, very well known scholars, who have uh, mentioned issues that uh, were serious, where uh, that seemed justified. Now, the other side of this is the husband's obligation to help the parents. Now, when the wife understands, I'm going to marry some person, and when the wife understands that his happiness is, uh, his happiness is, uh, meaning the husband's happiness is the wife's happiness. So when she does anything, she may make tea, she may, uh, she may do anything to please her husband. However, what I want to mention here again amongst the fuqaha, the main theme, even the word nikah, you know what it means, right? The word nikah means the intimacy between the husband and the wife. The main thing that she is absolutely obligated to uh, to to uh, do for her husband is to have the intimacy. But uh, somebody made a good point last week. Uh, I think it was you. That it's very interesting. Something we should explore because we usually just leave it at this and this, and we don't go further. But uh, but uh, uh, it was elaborated that uh, one would have. Uh, would it really have it, the proper intimacy that makes somebody happy if somebody's upset with their husband? So it's, it's, that aspect also should be looked at and probably researched to some degree. Okay, having said that, now the wife should try to make her husband happy. This is a general rule. It doesn't mean, for example, if she didn't make tea for her husband one day and he's upset and so then now everything is lost. It doesn't go like that. So it should be kept as a general rule. She needs to make her husband happy, as the husband needs to make her happy. But uh, so that means that as the husband is doing his duties, that if she can, if she, rather she should uh, help uh, her husband in his obligations to his parents, if she can. When I say she can, meaning she's able to, and it's the situation is before her, and so on and so forth. Okay. The second is. That regardless of how the relationship between is the, between the mother-in-law and daughter-in-law, she cannot stop the son from his obligations to his parents. There is a complete green light on this. And when I say green light, it means it's up to the individual. How much does he, the son, serve his parents? Well, there's a min the minimum is, there's no minimum in the sense of it depends upon the circumstances. If he doesn't have the time and or he has money or he's poor himself, these are all different situations. But in, on average, he should support his family, his parents to the point where they're able to live a happy life. This should be the, the goal. The goal, the ghaya, the maqsad is so that the parents, they feel that our son is fulfilling his obligations upon us. And in this obligation of his, the wife can't stop him. Just as the Prophet ﷺ said, if somebody comes between the husband and the wife, the third person is shaitan, meaning if the mother-in-law is interfering in the life of the husband and the wife, just as that is a negative thing, it is also a negative thing if the wife comes between the, the parents, particularly the mother, and the son in fulfilling his responsibilities to his parents. She can't stop him. So whatever her personal likings, her pickiness, whether she can become friends, she can get close or not close with her mother-in-law, no matter what, even if she has abused her in this case, because even if she's done wrong to her, even if she's oppressed her, even if she's uh, humiliated her in front of the whole family, but the obligation of the son still remains. The obligation of the son still remains. 
And so therefore, <coughs> she should not in any way, no matter what has happened, ever stop her son from fulfilling his obligations to his parents. Because that's his obligation. So that's the other thing that I wanted to say. Now, there are, of course, when two people get married, there's an understanding of what? There's an understanding of, of, of what the husband wants, like I said. So in that, one of the things is, is that, like let's say if there are ten sons and uh, two people got married and he's the, let's say, the youngest son or one of the younger sons, he knows he's not going to be really taking care of his parents that much, and so the wife doesn't expect it. So then that's an understanding that they have. And so one of the important things that I've learned uh, while reading both Western literature on this, uh, as well as uh, some of the uh, scholars of Islam, even the scholars of Islam have mentioned this, that one thing that should be clear before marriage is the expectation the husband has regarding the in-laws. And the reason for this is because so many, in fact, one scholar of Islam I was reading, he said this. He's, you know how I mentioned last time, most fights between a mother-in-law and daughter-in-law happen where? In the kitchen. In the kitchen. This scholar of Islam, I forget his name right now, he says that, uh, you know, if you don't have... <coughs> uh, thank you. If you're, if you're, if you're going to be sharing a kitchen, the chances are you'll be creating fire. Then he meant it in a literal way. And he's not, uh, you know, he's not, uh, uh, this is not a contemporary scholar who's being quoted. This is somebody traditional. So anyway, the point is, is that, so now the sad thing is, the better thing is, of course, that we are all living in harmony. The better thing is that the wife, she is able to honor the parents of the, uh, of the husband, that she feels comfortable with them, that she feels, after all, she left her house, and this is another thing, she's no longer, when she leaves her house, she's not obligated to listen to her parents anymore. She's not obligated to listen to them. She can listen to them. She can still have advice from them. She can still uh, respect them, and all of those things are there. They're still her parents. But the obligation of, 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 of obedience transfers from the parents to the husband. Meaning, uh, within the limits of the Sharia, of course. Okay? So, when that happens, she's now part of this family. So, obviously, when she's now part of this family, she has to feel that she is in harmony with the mother-in-law, with the sister-in-laws, with the rest of the family. This is the ideal situation. And for that, you have to have ihsan. For that, you have to have... And the thing, the thing is this, is that I'm going to now show you something very interesting. Remember this disparity between the fard and the ihsan that I have shown you, right? Zakat versus huh? sadaqah. Okay, now if you notice, on the day of judgment, what is more important? No, no, no. The fara'id is more important or ihsan is more important on the day of judgment? The fara'id are more important in the day of judgment. What happens interestingly, ihsan is more important in dunya. Ihsan becomes more important in dunya. It also has its extra credit. Its value in the hereafter is extra credit. The value in the hereafter becomes less. The value of fard in the hereafter is more. Nafal means what? Surplus. Right? It means extra credit. Meaning if you don't do it, it's okay. If you do it, it's okay. No harm. If you do it, and good if you did. But a fard can never equal to a nafal in the hereafter. In the hereafter. But ihsan is what helps improve the life of this world. Because why? When you're talking about uswatul hasana, the role model that gives you the ideal, that is the role model of ihsan. That's ideal for this life as well as the, the hereafter. And the Prophet didn't live at the level of fara'id. He lived at the level of ihsan. Meaning the best of dunya and the best of the hereafter is only attained 
when you are reaching for ihsan. So, if you give zakat, that's good, but really you become a better person if you're giving a lot of sadaq, you become a philanthropist. Then you're not giving one, uh, uh, you know, 2.5%, then you're giving 10%, 15% for good causes, for example. You are exercising your fard right if someone does wrong to you and you say something bad to them. It's allowed. لا جهر بالسوء إلا من ظلم You can't say something evil to someone unless they have wronged you. But that's, that's on the Day of Judgment. But if you want to things improve of dunya, at the level of dunya, you have to do ihsan. إِنَّ اللَّهِ يَعْمُرُكُمْ بِالْأَدْلِ وَالْإِحْسَانِ وَإِتَاءِ ذِي الْقُرْبَى وَيَنْهَا عَنِ الْفَحْشَاءِ وَالْمُنْكَرِ وَالْبَغِيِ So, this is one thing that you have to understand that the five pillars, they are to help you in your najat in the hereafter, right? But what is more than that? Because Islam is not in the hereafter. Islam, al-Islam, is in dunya. And dunya Islam, Islam is built over five things. Meaning your Islam is built over the five things that have your najat in the hereafter. But the rest of the building is built over that. Bunya Islam, Bunya, it is something is built over this. So something is built over Islam and the fara'id, the, the five pillars and the other muharramat, those are the things you have to do. So what am I trying to say? I'm trying to say that when you have a good civilization, a good tamadun, a good muhadara, muhadara, right? Hadara, muhadara and madaniya. Hadara. Hadara, right. Hadara and uh, mad when you have a good civilization, then you have people interacting at the level of ihsan within the society. For example, you bought some, something, someone says thank you, right? Some, you're gonna buy something, they smile, right? They have good customer service. This is ihsan, this is all ihsan. I mean, it's a commercial ihsan. It's, it's a fake ihsan, it's not a real ihsan. It's a commercial smile, it's a commercial thank you. It's all commercialized, but it is still, ex it is exercising what we call ihsan. So in dunya, if you want dunya to be better, husband and wife, if they live only at the fiqhi level of obligations to each other, they will be okay in the Day of Judgment maybe. The husband has to give her the minimum amount for her shelter, minimum amount for her food, minimum amount for her, uh, the, uh, for her clothing, a nafaqa, a, some monthly stipend, this is your stipend, and you pay your bills with the stipend, and will there be love in that relationship? No, you have to reach the level of ihsan to make dunya work. Dunya doesn't work. For example, your mother-in-law said something bad to you, and if you, you can then say something bad, and then you can say to the husband, well, she said this to me, and I said this to her, she was wrong, and maybe she was wrong, but that will be okay in the hereafter, because there's adl in the hereafter, but if you want things to get better in dunya, you're going to have to show what? You're going to have to show sabr. You're going to have to show restraint. You're going to have to show ikhlaq. I mean, all of these things of sabr and shukr, they are only true when they're only tested. And they're not true when they're not tested. And so uh, this was the main thing that I wanted to say about this uh, aspect of the Sharia. The other thing that I want uh, in general within the Sharia and in Asul al-Din, there is a hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu that is very important in this topic that I would like to uh, bring about because this will be true for all of the etiquettes that we learn. And that is that Islam differs from normal contemporary law in a very important way. And that is the Prophet Sallallahu said, لا ضرر ولا ضرر. And generally when the Sharia is silent, remember where I, was, I said the Sharia is silent on this issue regarding the in-laws and so on and so forth. Generally, when we find the Sharia silent in some place, we will fill those places, those areas with the bigger rules, the general rules. One of them is لا ضرر ولا ضرر. There is no hurting and nor causing of hurt. So this is how Islam looks at the issues. And I, I don't know if I've discussed this before, but I will share this with you so that you understand how significant this statement of the Prophet is and how the fuqaha have used this to understanding the Islamic law. So for example, uh, if there are two people, one person has a building, he has a building and he has a 
window on the second floor. Okay? And the people, they're living on the second floor. Now, what Western law requires is that they have, do they have the right to this window here? Yes, they do. Now somebody else makes a building here. He also puts a window here. But now he's able to peek into this other person's house. Western law says that if you don't like them looking at you, then you have to close your, you close your windows. You can't stop them from closing their windows. Because the issue, the central issue is freedom. The central issue is freedom. Islam doesn't look at it like that. Islam says, who is causing the harm? Who's causing the harm? What, the one who's causing the harm has to be stopped. So when he makes this building and puts a window here and he's looking through there, in Islam he would say, you have to shut down your window. You have to close your window. They don't have to close their window. You're the one who's causing the harm. And so this is a very, and you know, actually I had this conversation about this very issue, about this very example with a, a paralegal and an, attor an attorney that I know. And uh, so that, that's what they say. Yeah, of course, you know, they, they, I mean, they were very adamant about the, the level of freedom and, you know, it's their freedom. They should have the right to this window. But I think clearly, logically, uh, it, this person is impeding upon this person's freedom and he's the one who's causing harm. There are many examples of this within the Sharia. I'll give you another example. Let's say there is a man, he has a land. And then another person buys a land adjacent to that. Now he has a well that, feed, that is water for his family. Now he builds a well. His well sucks out all the water that is in his land. It takes it away. So then in the Sharia we're going to say, no, you can't have this well. Because this was his first. This was his right first. He had this well first. And so... Uh, So I was saying that in general, when we're dealing with the issue of the in-laws, la darra wa la darar has, has to be looked at. The other thing that has to be looked at is that, uh, like I said, some scholars say that if there is a clash between the mother-in-law and daughter-in-law, and why is this so important? It's amazing because as I was reading some of the scholars, some scholars have said this is a major issue, and because this is a major issue, they said, that the wife should be given a separate house. In fact, there are some fuqaha I found amongst the Hanafi that have, have recommended as a general rule that the husband and wife should live separately. And amongst them, some of the scholars of India, I read some things, they said, oh, this, this is why I was asking you this question, if they do it in the Arab world. Because this scholar in India, I won't take names because these are big names. This scholar in India, he said, the, the heritage of living with your parents is mostly from the Hindu culture. This is what he was trying to say. That's why I asked you the question if they help. Because I, when I was in Egypt, I didn't really see this. What I saw in Egypt is that uh, the parents are living separately from the children. But I saw some cases like that, but mostly I saw parents and children are not living together in the outer world. In Malaysia, Indonesia also, I know they don't live together. Mostly they don't live together. So then I was thinking, okay, maybe it is just an Indian uh, or a Desi phenomenon of the children living with the parents. But then Brother Khalid told me that no, about if you go back 50 years, 60 years, kids used to live with their parents. And if, in fact, if the kid left the parent, it was embarrassing, huh? Particularly in, uh, in the rural areas. The, the what? The countryside. If they are mm -hmm. not living in urban areas, mm -hmm. that would be like uh, some kind of a shame to leave your parents and go and live somewhere. So, 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 so anyway, the ihsan is whether the parent, uh, the, the husband and wife are living with the parents or not, this can also be affected by something we call orf. Right? Because orf would also play a big role in this, which is the, the cultural setting that people are in. But one thing that's clear, whether you're living with your parents or not living with your parents, the wife should not stop the son from fulfilling his obligations to his parents. Now, how much are those obligations? Is there a minimum amount? Is there a maximum amount? Again, there is no minimum or maximum amount. And this is why, by the way, one thing that the wives can appreciate is that the Prophet said, the service that you do for your parents 
has a reward in this life and has a reward in the hereafter. And the, the uh, making the parents angry has its negative consequences in this life and its negative consequences in the hereafter. So the wife, or the family rather, the whole of the family should see that serving the parents will definitely bring her good, will bring good in her dunya because her husband is servicing, doing service to her mother. So this will come around because, the, the, and there are many, many stories in Islamic civilization that we also hear about every now and then, that, pe and this is what the Prophet said, when you do good to your parents, its effect will happen to you in this life. And so if we understand this, just like if you give sadaqah, you're not going to lose your sadaqah, it's going to come back one way or the other. Maybe some problem will be taken care of, or some other thing will happen, or some misfortune was going to happen, is not going to happen. But the sadaqah comes back one way or the other. In the same way, when you service the parents, they will come back. When a wife will help her son service the parents, she should look at this as her good fortune in dunya and akhirah. She should look at this as her good fortune of her being able to service her husband's parents, which will bring him good, which will bring good to her children. And the other aspect that, uh, that one all should always consider, and you know, Islam is very interesting, like it's so beautiful uh, how Islam is with this kind of like understanding of circular things. What I mean by that is that you reap what you sow, right? Jo beach boge boi katoge, right? This idea that you you get what you earn. But if you are uh, going to be cruel to your parents, then your children will be cruel to you, to you, because they're going to watch that example. And so this we have to be very careful. And this is exactly what we say in our relationships in general. If someone's, uh, someone is hurting some girl, we say, would you like this to happen to your mother, to your sister? Right? This is what the Prophet said to a companion. So that idea that if you're not, if you're not, create, if you're not going at the level of Ihsan, if you're not going to the level of Ihsan, and you're not going to go beyond just the fiqhi aspects of things into the actual purpose of the Sharia, so both in terms of the benefit of dunya, as well as for purification of the self, ihsan works better. Fiqh only works for saving you in the hereafter. It doesn't work for, for, uh, for example, I mean just to be uh, clear, like qital fi sabilillahi subhanahu wa ta'ala is not a requirement of basic fiqh. It's only a requirement when you have an iman. So you're not going to be able to defend your country or your nation or your Islamic uh, Islam hood, you can say, uh, if uh, unless you have that level of ihsan where iman is that much iman is in you. So uh, I will end here now. Uh, so if there's any questions, I will take them. Inshallah. Push the red button.